I, I do have a couple of those initial thingies after my name, uh, but just call me Mark, all right? So let's, let's just go with Mark. Um, and ask questions at, at any time. So I'm gonna do kind of a combination PowerPoint presentation, um, classroom presentation with stuff on the board, uh, some examples, some kind of little experiments uh, to show you how well your tax dollars are being spent here at, at Boulder. Some incredibly expensive equipment, including marshmallows and toothpicks, and but that's about all we can afford here at Boulder. <clears throat> so where are you guys from? Boulder. Boulder? <laughs> Anybody not from Boulder? New York. New York? Okay. And so you came just for this? Of course. <laughs> and how about some of the non-Boulder people? Ah. Uh -huh. Longmont, okay. Morrison. Morrison, all right. Yeah, I actually uh, have property in Monta Vista, so I'm kind of familiar with that, uh, with nothing on it right now. <clears throat> and yeah, I, um, I do snow. Uh, I've worked at a lot of ski areas in mountain environments. That's still what I do. And I get really tired of the ski industry and resort town. So we bought mountain property and went to San Luis Valley to get as far away from the resort thing as we could. Uh, but still be in the mountains here in Colorado. <clears throat> so we're going to chat about a couple of different things, uh, but they all have to do with hydrology. And uh, I call this disappearing Christ, but I'm a snow guy, and actually I only had one requirement to do research, and that was I had to be able to ski to my research sites. <clears throat> and I actually managed to pull that off. And I'm finally starting to do forested work because I'm getting old and out of shape and it's harder to get to the Alpine. But uh, for 20 years, I did nothing but ski, uh, and ski and research that was related to skiing. And initially, it was really hard to get research. I mean, who wants to pay somebody to go skiing? Uh, but with changes in climate, what we realize is that um, one of our biggest resources is at risk. And the suits in D.C. get that now. And they didn't 20 years ago, but they really do now. And because we have things going on, 2000s were the warmest decade on record. Uh, glaciers are retreating. Permafrost is melting. Is that going to result in less runoff? So in Colorado, where do we get our water? Now, and how much comes from snow? Yeah, somewhere on uh, the 70 to 80 percent of our usable water is snowmelt runoff. And so it's a huge resource. And if we have less snow, we're going to have less usable water. And people get that. One of the economic engines in Colorado is the ski industry, and particularly in mountain towns. And an outstanding question is, is our changes in climate going to affect our ski industry? We'll, we'll chat a fair about, uh, about that. Is the mountain climate changing? Is, is that going to affect things like avalanches and rockfall? I'll talk just a little bit about that. And is this whole climate change thing a hoax, or is it uh, for real? And be glad to have that uh, discussion with you guys. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start with mountains as water towers and chat about why I think mountains are water towers. Then do an overview of basic hydrology. It's, it's supposed to be a classroom, right? So I'll actually like, get the chalk out and we'll walk through some things. Uh, <clears throat> and normally I wouldn't do this, but um, I'm going to talk about natural gas extraction and water. And it's such a hot topic now, I, I sort of can't talk, not talk about it because I do stuff in that field and people keep asking about it. So I'm going to actually talk a fair amount about it. Talk just a little bit about the mountain pine beetle and climate. Uh, and then go through a tutorial on climate change and how it may affect the ski industry. And, and I'm going to emphasize the tutorial part of that. And the reason is that it gives you a feel for how we can come up with an idea, sort of a forecast or scenarios of what the climate may be like in the future and how that might affect water resources. So anything that affects the ski industry is also going to affect water resources because we get most of our water from snowmelt. And in terms of water security, I was going to, if we have time and we can get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Himalayas. Now, has anybody 
been to Nepal, where the Himalayas here? Hiking, trekking, a couple of you. What, where, where, whereabouts? Uh, Amazon Sanctuary. Ah, cool. And you? Um, just out from... Um... Kat, Kathmandu? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, well, Kathmandu and, and um, across country. And... In the Everest region? Or... I'm sorry? In the Everest region? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. So probably out of Namchi Bazaar then. Yeah. So anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. And the reason is there's real concern about water security there, and it's a great analog for Colorado. And any changes in water security in that area are going to affect our national security. Because there's countries we're kind of interested in, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and water resources are critical uh, to those countries. And I'm actually doing a lot of research in that area. So for me, at least, it's, it's a hot topic. Right, global warming. So this is a website devoted to global warming uh, called globalwarminghoax.com, where only the truth heats up. And uh, I like this cartoon. And it's a polar bear saying, give me some candy. And uh, a, a small polar bear. <clears throat> and uh, mom says, no. And then uh, he says, give it or polar bears will die. And then it's here, take it. And that's how they trick kids into believing this whole global warming hoax. And we know it's a hoax because who started, who came up with this whole global warming thing? Yeah. Al Gore, right? It's, he's inconveniently stuck his tongue onto this frozen light post. But, and, and so just staying away from the whole climate change things. You know, one thing that uh, I think we can agree on in a lot of places where I chat is that snow and ice melt from mountains are an economically important source of water. You know, and that's, I think, a starting point. And that's what I'm going to emphasize here. Hey, why do we care? <clears throat> For a whole variety of reasons. Um, we need water to live. Uh, and we need sanitation and access to clean water, which is limiting in large parts of the world. Uh, where people use water is not always where the water is, and so we engineer water. Where does Boulder get its water supply? What's that? So 40% of Boulder's water comes from Boulder Creek. Right? And we, the city, and that's we, I guess, I live in the county, not the city, but the city owns the Boulder Creek watershed, and that's actually one of my main research sites, so I have a permit to go there. How many of you have been in the Boulder Creek city watershed? You have? In the watershed? Yeah. Well, I was skiing El Dorado the other day, that's the watershed, isn't it? Uh, I'm thinking, but the Boulder city watershed. So that's actually owned by the Boulder, a city of Boulder. It's closed to the public. It's, it's the headwaters of North Boulder Creek, where the Arapaho Glacier is. So good, I'm glad you guys haven't been there because uh, <laughs> Craig would have arrested you if you had. And he's a, he's a manager there and he loves to arrest trespassers. <laughs> but um, but th that's how important it is. So that's 40% of Boulder's water. <clears throat> uh, North Boulder Creek, 40% um, coming through uh, Eldora, uh, uh, Middle Boulder Creek, and 20% is from the Big Thompson Project, which comes from Granby. Goes underneath Rocky Mountain National Park and to Estes Park, and then flows down to the Boulder Reservoir, and that's the reason for the Boulder Reservoir. And so during winter, when snow melts shut off, that's where we get the majority of our water from uh, Boulder Reservoir which is actually from the other side of the Rockies, the West Slope. And so lots of engineering going on here in terms of water. We need that water for development, <clears throat> for maintaining uh, ecosystem services. Um, trout fishing is a huge economic engine here in uh, Colorado. Uh, pollution is always something that we need to worry about. Uh, and we're worrying about weather extremes. Uh, the Southwest right now is in for a rough time with the drought conditions uh, there. So we care about water for all kinds of reasons. And it goes back as long as there's been human beings. I, I kind of like this. 
Uh, the Chinese character for political order combines the uh, symbols for river and dike. And so political order comes out of this chaos of moving water around and making sure people have water security. And along with that uh, water as a driver, the English word rival, uh, in similar terms in other languages, derives from Latin rivalis, meaning one using the same stream as another, conflict right there. So water conflicts are historical and go back as long as there's been human beings. All right, <coughs> trick question. <coughs> Which direction does water flow? There you go. Towards money, right? <laughs> and what's water good for? Okay, whiskey's for drinking, right? And water's for fighting. And who, who came up with that quote? Who was it? it was definitely somebody in the West, Mark Twain. And so we've been fighting over water out here for a long time. All right, so why are mountains water towers? <clears throat> well, one reason is because when we look up, yeah, we can see the water towers, right? <clears throat> There's a whole variety of reasons. In mid-latitude areas around the world, in general, we get increasing precipitation with elevation. But what, what's the annual uh, precip amount here in Boulder? It's about 18 inches. And what do you think it is on the Continental Divide? Headwaters of North Boulder Creek, headwaters of uh, uh, Middle Boulder Creek. 40 It's about, yeah, very good, it's about 40 inches. And that's a big difference. And so we get a lot more precip as we go up in elevation. And what, what's the reason for that? Orographic uplift. Orographic uplift, there you go. <laughs> and what's that causing? I mean, what, what does that mean? I'm not teaching the class. <laughs> <laughs> but I was a geography major. <laughs> okay. I mean, and you paid attention. That was good. <laughs> so as an air mass hits the mountains, you get uplift. And that air is getting colder, and as it gets colder, the relative humidity goes up uh, because the air can't, colder air can't hold as much water as warm air. And at some point, the relative humidity hits 100%. When the air gets cold enough, and it rains, and if that air temperature is below zero degrees C, it snows. Okay with that? And so mountains are the reason we have all that rain. Without the mountains, we'd look like Kansas and we get about as much rain as Kansas, which I don't think would be as much fun. All right, as we go up in elevation, we get more snow than rain. And further, uh, the higher we are in elevation, the more snow we get versus rain. And that's absolutely important because snow is a water bank. It's like increasing your balance in your bank compared to, to rain. All right, so we get this water bank effect. Uh, with that increasing snow, we're storing that water, and it's released when we need it, which is in the spring and in the summer. And that's one of the problems with climate change. If climate change does occur, temperatures are warmer, snow melting starts earlier, we're going to release that snow before we need it. And what do you do then? What would be a strategy to, to deal with that problem? Dams. Yeah, so more storage. And dams are one way to do it, reservoirs. There's underground aquifers that people are using now, which I think is actually a, a good way to go. Uh, but that is one of the strategies. One of the things that people don't realize is that as we go up in elevation, the quality of our water increases. Right? Not a whole lot of buildings uh, in the headwaters of North Boulder Creek. So we don't have septic tanks, we don't have all those sources of pollution, we don't have grazing. We're above a lot of those perturbations that we as humans make that cause a decrease in water quality. And so most uh, cities, most towns, prefer to get their water from high elevation because the water quality is better 
and because the water quality is better, treatment costs are a lot less. Does that make sense? Yeah? So I'm going to pose a question uh, regarding Theo Colburn's work, the endocrine disruption. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, you know, VOCs are actually really hard to measure, uh, and I do some of that work. Um, and, there, and with the whole fracking thing, uh, there's a lot more people paying attention to it right now. We're, and that's just starting. Had, people had not paid attention to it at all in the past. And so there's not good data on VOCs. VOCs are? Uh, excuse me, volatile uh, organic carbons. And that's, they're all lightweight carbons, so it's propane, ethane, uh, butane, benzene, things of, of that nature. And some of those are not very good for you. And there's no two ways about that. And we can let's let's not go there right now. <laughs> but uh, uh, the highest ozone concentrations that we get, and VOCs are a precursor for um, uh, ozone, which is destructive uh, uh, at ground level, are at about 7,000 feet because it's a combination of VOCs coming up, as you're saying, nitrous oxides, and uh, intense sunlight. As you go higher up in the mountains, it gets colder, right? And so there's less incoming sun, correct? No, so is there more sunlight as you go higher up? But how can there be more sunlight if the air temperature is colder? But, <laughs> the air is thinner. The air is thinner. So the air density decreases exponentially as you go up in elevation. Uh, and we're actually are closer to the sun. There's more incoming solar radiation. It's actually a big amount. I mean, it's, it's a big change. Uh, but it's not as uh, warm because the density of air is lower and it can't hold that sunlight. And that's why when you're hiking in the Rocky Mountain National Park, if you're in direct sun, it's really warm. And as soon as you get in the shade, you've got to put on a, a coat or, or something because it's a lot colder when you don't have that direct incoming solar radiation. And so be, one of the uh, catalysts for the formation of ozone is solar radiation. And so we end up with the highest amounts at six or 7,000 feet, uh, which is counterintuitive. And there is a lot of ozone damage uh, from that. <clears throat> Back to uh, water quality, uh, city of New York, Pretty big water user, probably the biggest in the United States. Uh, you're from New York. 90% of the water in New York City comes from the mountains. And they just spent seven to $10 billion upgrading their catchments up there. And there's you know, houses up there, there's communities. And so they're doing a ton of activities to um, make sure that they don't contaminate uh, the water system there. And in general, they don't treat the water. I mean, because the water quality is that good. And so, yeah, we're thinking, ah, water quality, water quality. I mean, that's a huge thing for New York. And if they had to treat all that water, the cost would just go through the roof. And that's why they've been spending all that money uh, <clears throat> in those environments, uh, working with landowners, households, communities, et cetera, to keep that water quality high. And then the other thing with this water bank effect is um, if you capture that water high, put it in a pipe, the delivery cost is zero, the operational cost. The only cost is to put the pipe in. And then you just turn the handle and gravity brings that water to you. So people like municipalities, towns, uh, industry like to capture water at high elevation because it's free delivery and it's good water quality. What's also happening is when we go up in elevation is that we end up with more available water because ET decreases, and ET stands for evapotranspiration. Way more than half the water that falls in the United States ends up back in the atmosphere through ET, and it's not available for human use. It's just recycled back. 
Now, running it through plants, forests, you can make the case that that is a good use. But it's not going to be available for surface water or groundwater recharge. So the loss of water to ET is a big deal. As we go up in elevation, and particularly when we get above tree line, it's colder, there's less vegetation, and so the loss of water to evapotranspiration goes way down, and so we end up with more effective water. For the same amount of input, we get a lot more usable water because of the decrease in ET. That makes sense? So ET stands for evapotranspiration, but the transpiration part accounts for about 90 percent of ET throughout the United States. And transpiration is when uh, trees are undergoing photosynthesis and respiration. <clears throat> they pull water up from their roots to support those activities and then transpire the water back to the atmosphere. So trees are straws that just suck water up and pump it to the atmosphere. So if we want to increase available water, what's one way that we could do it? Cut the trees. I mean, it does potentially work. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's some potential problems with that. You guys remember 2002? <laughs> Big drought year. Uh, way down in water, there is a, uh, a, a referendum on Amendment A. You guys remember what that was? It was, a bond, it was the issue of bond to capture water at the Colorado-Utah border that we have a right to but can't use and pump it to the East Slope. And, the, and uh, who was the governor then? Owens and the water buffaloes really pushed this thing. They got it on the ballot. They couldn't really come up with the number of what it would cost, or what the state was going to issue bonds to recover it. But the initial estimate was a minimum $2 billion. <clears throat> But within that, which uh, they kind of squirreled away, was also looking at uh, clear-cutting all the state forest lands uh, in Colorado to increase usable water runoff. And another advantage of snowmelt, which isn't obvious, is that snowmelt acts like a drip irrigation system. Now, how many of you garden? And how many of you have a drip irrigation system? A number of you. So it's a really efficient way to move water through your system, right? Because you're just adding a little bit in the right places, and then the plants can take it up. <clears throat> and snow, snow melt acts that way because the snow can't melt very fast. When you get a rain coming, storm coming in and dropping rain, that rain hits the ground, interacts with it, and it's gone. And because of that, you end up with uh, less infiltration in particular. But with snow, because it melts slowly, you really get efficient use of that water. All right, so you add all those up, and we end up with way more water coming that's usable that comes off the alpine during snow melt than we get with rain on forested areas. So mountains really are water towers for these reasons. So mountains are water towers. And uh, it will make the case that our snow and ice resource is sensitive to changes in climate, regardless of what causes climate to change. Whether it's humans or Martians or whatever, any change in climate is going to ha potentially have a big effect on our water resource that comes from snow and ice. It's really quite sensitive to it. And in particular, if we have no change in annual precip, but we end up with more rain and less snow, i.e. Uh, the snow line moves up in elevation, we're going to have less usable water. Because right? we've lost that storage effect. And when it rains, that water just runs off, and we're going to not be able to use it uh, for a whole variety of reasons. All right. So that's enough on that for right now. So, let's see, how do we turn this thing off? All right here.
So water is a pretty cool thing. And it actually has a lot of unique properties. Can you guys think of any of those? What those might be? Depends where they're freezing. What's that? And so that's one. That's one of the only uh, naturally occurring substances that does that. Water expands when it freezes. And another way to say that is the density decreases when it freezes, when it goes from the liquid state to the solid state. And that's incredibly important because that didn't happen, ice wouldn't float. Instead, it would sink to the bottom, which is what almost all other substances do. When our lakes froze, freeze, they'd freeze the entire water column and they would probably never melt out during the summer. There wouldn't be enough energy. What happens with lakes is uh, the lake water freezes, ice forms at the surface, and then it insulates the water underneath. And if it went the other way around, uh, our planet would be way colder. So it's, it's a big deal. Another unique property. <clears throat> High specific heat. And, and what does that mean? It takes a lot of heat to warm it up. What's that? It takes a lot of energy to heat it. Yeah, so just to make a, a one degree change in temperature, uh, it takes a whole lot of energy uh, to do that. And so if you live by an ocean, by the Great Lakes, your temperature doesn't change very much because as temperatures change, say it gets hot, that water is sucking up the heat, keeping the air temperature cold or cooler. And if it gets cold, that water is going to release energy and keep the temperature warm. So that's a uh, high specific heat really moderates uh, the climate. Is this the solid liquid and Yeah, so the three phases of water occur simultaneously on the surface of the Earth. And those phases are solid, liquid, and gas. All right, so I teach a class called Snow Hydrology. I'm teaching it now. And when people say water, what are they talking about? Liquid. Yeah, but isn't ice water? And it is. And so you've got to be clear about those phases when you're around me. Because people imply water means liquid, but it doesn't. It's in these three phases, and I'm a snow person, and the most important phase is the solid phase. And it's still water. Okay. It, it is incompressible. And, and actually, that has a big effect on, on um, uh, things like the elevation of the surface of the Earth. Uh, and so we have a lot of water uh, that's stored as groundwater. If you pump a lot of that out, what happens is you now have lost that incompressible um, volume of water there, and the land sinks. And there's a lot of subsidence because of groundwater uh, withdrawal. Anything else? Latent heat. What's that? Latent heat. Uh, latent heat, but a lot of things have that as well. But not as high. Ah, but the latent heat, the amount of energy because of the high specific heat, that's needed for latent heat or release, depending on which way you're going, is really high. Water actually has, for its molecular weight, a really high boiling temperature, a really high freezing temperature. Polarity. What, what does that mean, polarity? It's got a positive end side to it and a negative side to it. So, and it has high surface tension. And water is a really good solvent. And the reason it's a good solvent is because of this polarity. So let's <clears throat> look at this in a little bit more detail. Let's see, what's a good color here? This will go red.
I'm going to crank up the red color a little bit here. All right, if I put this paper towel in here, can the water go up? And it is. You can see it there. But which way is gravity pulling it? So how can it go up? In fact, it's... <laughs> Stop, stay. Stop. Um, I was going to get it. It goes up pretty high, actually, but this thing's falling apart. Uh, but yeah, you can see that that red color has gone up against gravity. And that's capillary tension uh, and cohesion. And that's driven by the fact that water has these charges in it. That makes sense? All right, now. <clears throat> Let's see. Is this wet? Yep. Damp. Damp? Any water coming out? No, but it has water in it, right? And so that water is being held pretty tightly. See, this is geology, right? So I'm not in this building. So I'm going to pour some water in here. It's held, right? Right, and so the sponge is like a soil. You can put water in there up to a certain point, and it's not moving, right? It's, it's stuck there through a couple of uh, processes. Uh, internally, yeah. I mean, a different sponge would be able to hold different amounts of water. And uh, that's one of the ways that you characterize soil is by the water holding capacity. So which kind of soil type has the highest water, uh, water holding capacity? Clays, yeah. And, but clay, water in, in clay really isn't movable, even though it has a tremendous amount of storage, uh, because uh, the electrical charge in, in clay is so high, it keeps that water from moving. Huh, well, boy, no water's coming out. Oh, now we got some water coming out. So what does that mean? What's happened to our system here? Saturated. So we're saturated. And, and actually, we might not be saturated. So we can actually look at that. And uh, <coughs> so let's say we got kind of a soil column here. Right, we add a little bit of water, so these are soil particles, and it's held really tightly, right? And that's hydroscopic water. And that's what that, um, this was, the sponge, uh, initially, there was a little bit of water there, but it was held really tightly, it can't move. And then when we add enough, we exceed what's called the wilting point. Gardeners know what that is. And at this point, we have our soil. We have our hydroscopic water. But now we have a little bit more. All right? And that water can move. All right? So this is capillary water. And it's going to move from... Um, higher amounts of water to lower amounts because that's going to affect the tension in the system. And the tension's uh, the opposite of pressure. It's essentially reverse pressure. And you think of tension as the ability to suck. The higher you suck, the more water you can bring in, right? And so the drier a soil is, the higher the tension. <clears throat> if we keep adding water here, so soil moisture, doing this. It's increasing and in, right here we're at field capacity. Alright. 
And if we keep adding water now, what's going to happen? There's our soil particles. We got hydroscopic water. We have capillary water. And now we're going to add some more water on top of that. We still have some air spaces, but gravity is going to pull on that. So we have gravitational water. And that water can move in response to gravity. And so to recharge our aquifers, to get past the soil, you have to add enough water to it that you exceed the field capacity. Once we exceed the field capacity, then water can move by gravity. Until we do that, water is just going to go from uh, higher amounts of water to lower amounts of water through capillary action. That makes sense? Where do you think the term field capacity came from? Yeah, from, from ag, from farmers. And so when you irrigate, for a farmer, you know, th people uh, fertilize uh, because of limiting nutrients. It, nitrogen tends to be limiting, and so you add nitrogen fertilizer, and you're going to get higher productivity. But the most essential limiting element for, for agriculture is water and we irrigate, right? And so as a farmer, to maximize production, you want to irrigate up to field capacity so that you know that there's always enough available water, but you don't want to irrigate above that because then you're paying for water that's going to leave your system, right? And that makes no economic sense. So that's where the term field capacity uh, came from. And then uh, <clears throat> at some point we're saturated. And by saturated, what we mean is all the pore space, the air spaces, are now filled with water, and there's no air left in that system. Comfortable with that? All right, and again, to get recharge, we actually have to come up to field capacity before we can get water moving down below to recharge our aquifers. What's that? Yeah, salt really holds on to the water. So, but all, the, uh, all these different types of water, hydroscopic water, capillary water, gravitational water, and the tension at which you go from one to the other is a function of the soil type and the things in the soil, like the amount of salt. So it's it, uh, really sensitive to that. It's also sensitive to how uh, the soil particles are arranged. And so with the clay, I happen to have one, another one of these expensive teaching aids here. You know, their clay part, particle looks like this, except it's six-sided. But it has a really high surface-to-volume ratio, and it's, it's a, essentially a playing card. And so you stack them up like, like this, and you've got water in between, but it can't really move. And it's held there by the uh, ionic charge on the clay mo uh, molecules as well. Whereas the sand right here, you know, these put sand together and you end up with big pore spaces between it. And these connect really well. And so sand can't hold very much water and it transmits water really efficiently. And so for a farmer, what you want is you don't want too much water, right? That's going to waterlog your soil. So if you have a high clay content, that's, that's bad. But you don't want sandy soils because the water is going to run right through them. And so the ideal soil is a loam, which is 40% um, sand, 40%, uh, um, what's the one in between, silt, and 20% clay. So you get the right mixture. My English is not good. Yeah. My question was not about soil. It was about the salt content of the water and the salt content of the ground, like uh, nearby the sea area versus inland or dry salt lakes that become agricultural versus... Yeah, no, salts, salts are, are a problem. And one of the things that happens in terms of salts, for example, is in uh, Kansas, is um, you're close 
to the 100th meridian there, and it's not very wet. Uh, and we get a little bit of this in Boulder as well. <clears throat> and so water will penetrate, uh, gra gravitational water, but only down to about 10 or 15 centimeters. Right? And then the plants transpire it back up, and they leave behind the salt. And that salt builds up, and you get what's called hard pan. And there the porosity is so low that there's almost no storage there at all. And if you get too much of a salt buildup, and, and this happens in places like deserts, uh, Israel, uh, San Joaquin Valley in California, uh, where they brought in water uh, to these desert type soils, really high production for decades, but then the salt content builds up and up and up, and then your productivity goes down, and you have to do weird things like flush the salts out and stuff like that. Uh, I remember that because I grew up in San Joaquin Valley, and I was into digging holes and making caves, because there's no mountains there, man. That's, you had to make your own. And we'd hit this hard pan layer, which is this salt buildup, and it would break shovels. I mean, it was that hard. I, I can't hear that. The penetration of the shot in Arab into the delta. The penetration of the uh, Arabian uh, what is called the Arabian Sea? Yeah. Into the delta. Oh well getting salt water intrusion is just a bad thing. Is it something that can be reversible? You um yeah, but it, it takes water. Okay. Yeah. And the reason that you're getting salt intrusion is because you don't have water. And most likely if it's an intrusion, that means the system's changed and you've overdrafted and what you don't have the pressure now that the water had because it's incompressible to hold back the seawater. There's a void and there's a, a pressure gradient from the sea or the ocean into the land and so you get the salt water intrusion. That's happened in Bangladesh. Uh, it's happening um, along a lot of coastal cities in the United States. And it's actually a real problem because the ratio is about 16 to 1. If you lose a foot of water, you get 16 feet of salt uh, incursion because of the difference in pressure. <clears throat> all right, so we got these charges and all that kind of good stuff there. Why is water molecule charged? So water is pretty simple, right? It's H2O. It's about the simplest formula you could have. But it's charged. What is, how, does it, how does that happen? Position of the hydrogen and oxygen atoms of the molecule itself. Yeah, so if you draw out, draw out the molecules, this is oxygen. And this is hydrogen. They always have this characteristic shape. And they're hundred and four point five degrees apart, the two hydrogen atoms. And so we get this triangle or V shape, and all water molecules have that shape. And that leads to this polarity, and the reason is <coughs> So this is basic principles, uh, but everything we're going to talk about is based on this. So we got uh, an oxygen atom here, and how many electrons are associated with that oxygen atom? So it's eight. <clears throat> But they're distributed this way. So electrons are distributed in shells or orbits around atoms. And the first orbit is filled when there's two electrons. Right? And atoms 
always like to have their shelves filled or empty. So we have a situation here where we have two electrons here. We have six electrons in the outer orbit. And how many electrons does it take to fill that? Very good. So eight electrons, so it's too short. All right? And if we put a hydrogen here, it's got one electron. And it would like to have two. All right? And so they share. And that's called a covalent bond. And by sharing electrons now, what's happened is we filled the outer orbit of uh, the oxygen atom, and uh, we filled the orbit around the hydrogen atom, so they're happy. And those bonds are really hard to break. Right? They're really energetic. It's about 450 kilojoules per mole of energy. And if you want to impress your fans at the next cocktail party, you can tell them that. <clears throat> but that's a lot of energy, right? Let's see, what's one of our alternative fuels? Hydrogen gas. And where does the hydrogen come from? Water. From water molecules. And you've got to break this bond. And I'm telling you, it ain't happening. So uh, unless they can come up with some way where you're, you're taking energy from another system that would be wasted, uh, and then you can break it, but I, I just don't see a future for hydrogen gas because of that. This bond is so stout, it just takes a tremendous amount of energy to break it. And hydrogen gas works fine. It's just, it takes energy to use it, or to get it, and it takes more energy to, than you're going to get from it. So I, I don't see it being a winner. All right, so the question is, what's going on? Well, we got electrons moving back and forth here, and... There's none over here. So there is a positive charge right here and right here. All right? And what's happening with the hydrogen, or excuse me, the oxygen atom is <clears throat> they like to pair up. Electrons like to pair up. And so we end up with these two pairs here and these two pairs here. And we call those lone pairs. Right? And they obviously have double the charge of these classic bad drawing, these individual ones here, and so they push them away. Right? So these poor, lonely electrons are pushed away from this, these two loving couples <coughs> right here, and they're stuck on this side. And they get pushed away until the charges balance out and that balances out at 104.5 degrees apart. Right? And so this is characteristic of all oxygen atoms that are interacting with hydrogen to make water. And that's how we end up with this characteristic shape, uh, <coughs> kind of V-shape or triangle shape of water. Because these electrons are over here, we have a negative charge right there. Okay. And there's symmetry to it. So this negative charge is balanced by that positive charge. This negative charge is based, balanced by this positive charge. Right? So what's the net charge? Zero. It's zero. But we have a permanent positive side and a permanent negative side. So we call that a permanent dipole movement. Right? And that's why water is charged. And all this other unique stuff that happens with it going up against the pull of gravity, et cetera, is because of that, these charges that are on every single water molecule. Okay? So I'm going to change the subject a little bit, or it sounds like it, but, I'm, but it's not. What's the color of snow? White. White, and how come? Anybody? Yeah, snow has a really high albedo, in the visible wavelengths. And that just means it's a really good reflector. And it's not spectrally dependent. So in the visible wavelengths, snow is going to reflect all the various colors, the various wave, uh, wave bands, red, blue, orange, yellow, green, et cetera, the same. White is the color you get when you add all the other colors together. So that's why snow is white, is because 
all the lights reflected, all the different colors are reflected, and so we see a white surface. Mm -hmm. Just kind of. Why are all the different colors reflected? What's that? Why are all the different colors reflected? Is it because of the structure, like a crystal structure, or is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I can really get into this. <laughs> Be careful. You asked me a leading question. Um, what's the refractive? So the refractive index of light. So sorry, you made me do this. It's, I, otherwise, I wouldn't have. Uh, so this is the refractive index of light. So <clears throat> if you're out fishing and you're taking your kids with you and they poke a fishing pole into the water, what happens to the fishing pole? Bends. Yeah, it breaks, right? Bends. Right? And that's this part. That's a refra uh, real part of the refractive index of light. And it bends because the real part of the refractive index of light is a function of how fast photons are moving. And they move slower in water than they do in air. And so it looks like they broke, the stick broke or the fishing pole broke. I mean, I still remember seeing that as a kid going, oh man, my dad is going to be so mad at me. <clears throat> and then pulling out and going, it's not, I mean, that's why I'm a, that's why I'm a professor. You know? <laughs> and so it's just like too much. So that, that's why I have to answer this. Um, and then this is the imaginary part, and K is the absorption coefficient. <clears throat> okay, it doesn't have any units. We're going to go from 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 2 as a function of wavelength. And the wavelength, lambda, is going to be in microns. And it looks something like this. So what are the visible wavelengths in, in microns? Another good uh, party conversation. <laughs> kind of it really helps break the ice, you know. So it's... Zero point four to zero point seven is visible the visible wavelengths. And where does the uh, sun put out most of its energy? In the visible wavelengths. That's the maximum wave band that the sun puts out energy in. And that's pretty interesting. Our eyes are adapted tuned to the visible wavelengths, which is the wave band where the sun puts out the majority of its energy, the peak wave band. Now that's either evolution, God, intelligent design, I mean, whatever, but it's, it's real. I don't think it's random. I, there's a reason for that. And so K here, which is what we have right here, is the ability to absorb a photon. It's absorption coefficient. And this value right here, 10 to the minus 10, is incredibly low. And that's why snow is, has such a high reflectance. The photon, it's not like the photons bounce off a table surface. They actually go inside a snow grain, but they're not absorbed because this attenuation coefficient is so low in the visible wavelengths. And it's low in all the visible wavelengths. And so there's no selection for absorption for a particular wavelength, they're all reflected pretty much equally. Not quite equally, but equal enough that with respect to the snow surface, we see all the colors, and so it looks white. Now, when you look at glacier ice, what color is that? Blue. Blue, and the reason it's blue is because there is a slight difference. And as photons go through ice, and they'll go through ice pretty deeply, like tens of meters. Uh, <clears throat> the less air that's in there, the, the better the penetration of photons. And the blue wavelength has the most energy, and so it's absorbed or attenuated the least. And that's uh, the most energetic uh, wave band that we can see with our eye. So that's why I, uh, ice looks blue, because it actually is it, when it penetrates deep enough. All the other colors are absorbed. OK with that? So why, why does snow have six flakes, or, 
are six sides. Snowflake. Yeah. Snowflakes are six sided, right? Why? How many of you made snowflakes in grammar school? I mean, I, I did too, you know. <clears throat> right? And did you ever think to ask why they're six sided? So we're going to work on that. <laughs>